talk to you today about a mine disaster that happened in Chile. And uh, it was a fall of ground uh, in a mine in northern Chile. About 800,000 tons of rock was displaced. This fall of ground was not a seismic event. It's important to note that. Chile is well known for earthquakes, but this was a man-made disaster. I think we've, talked, we've heard some talks this morning about other man-made disasters we're dealing with. Same thing here. The fall of ground trapped 33 miners, and this presentation will go through the, uh, some of the background on that situation, as well as the rescue effort and the mining industry pulling together to achieve what was possible, which was rescuing these miners. I want to talk a little bit about mine safety, first of all, because that's at the crux of all of this. And, and there's some public misconceptions. The graph uh, on the screen is a measure of safety. This is the lost time injury frequency in the province of Ontario for all industries. A and mining is circled in the middle. Now, you might be surprised to see mining has one of the lowest frequencies of injury in Ontario. You're safer to work in an underground mine than you are to work in a hospital. Now, it, the, the, the difference here, th there's no debating that there's hazards in mining. And I would be the first to tell you that an underground mine is more hazardous than a hospital. But it's how we deal with those hazards. It's how we make our workplaces safe that are important. And what this graph is showing that the Ontario mining industry is doing a pretty good job of making their workplaces safe for their workers. The next graph is the same graph except that now I've added the safety record of the San Jose mine. I've had to change the scale of the graph. Uh, the frequency, the lost time injury frequency for mining in Ontario uh, runs about 0.8. I won't get into the detail of how it's calculated, but in a relative term, the San Jose mine injury frequency is about 25 to 1 versus a 0.8 to 1. What this means, and these statistics that I had were from 2006 for San Jose, 250 employees worked at that mine in 2006. There were 150 injuries that year, 55 of them what they classified as serious injuries. This was a mine that hurt people. This was a dangerous mine. This is the exception. Okay? Chile in general has good safety record. They have some of the most advanced mining operations in the world. This wasn't one of them. I'll talk a bit about that. So where is the mine located in northern Chile? Uh, the, the San Jose mine is about a, an hour and a half flight north of Santiago, which is the, the political, the geographical, the cultural center of Chile. Chile is a beautiful country. It's an amazing country. Uh, the northern part uh, is a mining district. And Chile itself is a mining country, largest producer of copper in the world, uh, and, uh, and uh, a very impressive mining industry. The location of the mine is in the Atacama Desert. Uh, the Atacama Desert is known as the driest place in the world. There are some areas that have not seen rain in 100 years. Uh, it is also the home of about 800 operating mines, which is hard for us to picture. When I think about the mining in, in Ontario or in Canada, the number of mines operating in this district is phenomenal. And there are some very large mines. There's a lot of very small ones. You can get an idea of the terrain. It is truly a desert. Uh, it's also very interesting because it's only about 45 kilometers from the ocean. So you can drive from this point and, and get to a beautiful coastline, but the rain doesn't get here. So the San Jose mine is in the middle of this desert. This picture is taken from our drill rig, from our drill site, looking down on the San Jose mine. You can see the terrain. The mine itself started operation in 1889. It's not a new operation. It's been around for hundreds of years. Uh, it was originally a copper and gold mine. Uh, most recently, it mined uh, gold. Production rate of about 30,000 tons per month, uh, which uh, generated 50 kilograms of gold per month. That's what the mine was bringing to surface. That was their revenue stream. Now this is a schematic that shows a section through the mine and, and gives you a little bit of detail on uh, uh, just what happened. Uh, the mine has 
what we call ramp access. Uh, there's a tunnel of four meters by four meters in cross section, and that's how people get underground. Now, every mining, uh, I should say most mining legislations, most mining countries have legislation which requires you to establish a second means of egress. That just makes sense. If you've got one way to get into the mine, you have to establish another way to get out. And that's, th that's the law. That's the law in Chile as well. In, two in 2003, the mine inspectors recognized that this mine did not have a second means of egress. So they cited the mining company. They gave them orders to build it. When the cave-in happened in 2010, that escapeway had still not been completed. And that was a factor in this. Definitely. What happened in this mine, uh, the mine operates by a system we call sublevel stoping. What they will do, they will excavate large caverns, take the ore out, but because of the pressure of the rock above, those openings aren't stable. Okay? So somehow you have to support them. So the method of support is what we call backfill. It's a ver very standard method in mining is you would put waste rock, cement, you would put material back in that opening so it would hold the walls up and, and stabilize the ground. Now what they had done uh, above the 400 meter level uh, from about uh, 235 meters to 400 meters, they had not filled a stope. But what they had done is they had continued to mine below so they de destabilized the mine. So when I mentioned at the start, this isn't a seismic event. The engineering was done. The operations was not carried out as per the engineering. They destabilized the mine. The mine caved in. And what happened was the stope wall caved in and it's estimated a, a block of uh, uh, the stope wall, 135 meters high, by 100 meters wide, by 20 meters deep, came off of this stope. Now when this rock came down, it caved the, the center portion of the mine, the mine from 400 meters to about uh, 250 meters in depth. The miners that were above this cave-in got out. And a few of the miners commented they wished they'd been trapped. Okay? But they only made that comment after the rescue. Okay? When they saw the rescued miners on Letterman and going to World Cup events, but, but nobody wished they were down there until the rescue occur had, had happened. Uh, 33 miners were trapped uh, below. Now what the miners are trained to do is look for the nearest refuge station. And uh, th this shows the location of the refuge station below the cave-in. Uh, it was uh, around 680 meters below surface. Refuge station is eight meters long, six and a half meters wide, and four and a half meters high. So the group congregated there, and then they put together their plans. The first thing, they tried to get up the, up the ramp, and they couldn't get, uh, the ramp had been caved in. They went to the egress. In this picture, these dotted lines show an, an egress system that was planned. They went to the first egress raised. The ladders hadn't been installed. So they had no means of escape. The miners didn't have communication with surface. They didn't have electrical power. The only food they had was what they had brought down for their lunches that day. Uh, they did have water, not potable water, processed water, but, but they did have water, uh, which, was, which was important in them surviving uh, uh, until the first breakthrough occurred. Uh, so that was, that was the miners. They were down below. Uh, one of the presentations earlier talked about heat in the mine. Uh, this mine was warm, not what we would call a hot mine, but uh, in that area, the temperature was probably about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or 33 degrees Celsius. So it was warm. In the meantime, up above, the rescuers tried to go down the ramp unsuccessfully. The ramp had been caved in. They tried to go down the, uh, the egress rays, and the, the condition in that rays were so poor that they couldn't get through. When they got down the ramp, they recognized that they couldn't drill and blast in this area. It could possibly destabilize the whole mine and the cave-in could go right to surface and there'd be no chance at all of rescuing the miners. So the next thing that happened right away, there were three companies that began drilling. The idea is to drill a hole to break through to find out if the miners are alive. 
And what the, what the, there were three companies, one of them, Terra Service, was our partner in Chile. They're drilling what we call reverse circulation holes. It's a five inch diameter hole, but you can't directional drill these holes. So they were drilling in the general direction of this refuge station, which is 700 meters below surface. Okay. What happens when you're drilling in rock is, is the structure of the rock will deflect the drill bit. Okay. So these drill holes never go straight. But what they were doing, the, as they drilled the holes, they would survey them and they would get an idea of the trend of the rock. And then the next hole, they would shift that hole to try and compensate for the trend. Now the first hole Terra Service drilled broke through at about 500 meters. It broke through above in one of the old workings, so it was lost. The second hole they drilled went past 700 meters, so they knew they had missed their target. While this drilling was going on, the miners down below, uh, when you're underground and someone's drilling in rock, you can hear it. It's very hard to tell where it's coming from, but you can hear it. The miners knew that, they were, that the rescuers were drilling. They knew that there were people trying to get to them. So there, were, there was hope there. They didn't know what technology was being used, but they knew people were trying to find them. The third hole that Terra Service drilled broke through on August uh, 17th, and it broke through about 688 meters below surface. It did not break through in the refuge station. They were aiming for the refuge station. It broke through up the drift about 20 meters up. So even that hole deflected, but it did hit an opening. And the miners were able to find that. When the driller brought the bit back to surface, the message tied to the bit is uh, what's shown on the screen, translated, the 33 of us are fine in the shelter. Everything changed. Okay? From a point in time where the miners weren't sure if they would survive, now the question became when would they get out? There was confidence a rescue could be done with the technology we have. The question was, how long would it take? This is, the, uh, this is a picture of the setup. By the way, all these pictures are taken by our crews on site, the, the majority of them. This is a picture of the setup that was used to lower material down to the miners. Once a hole was broken through, uh, uh, food, medicine, water, electricity, communications were all established through this five inch borehole. And and this is the setup you can see, just a simple winch lowering material down. This is a graphic I took from a, from a magazine which uh, lists some of the different materials that went down. I don't know if you can see this, the zero bottles of wine down below. <laughs> now, I'll apologize to the media in advance for this comment, uh, but when the first meal went down, the miners said, can we have wine with the meal? And there was great debate about it. In the papers the next day, the headline read, Trap Miners Dealing with Alcoholism Issues. So, so there, it was a media frenzy. It was a very interesting sight to be at. So materials are going down. In the meantime, there are a number of groups. The Chilean government received at least 21 proposals from companies all around the world of an approach or, or plans to rescue the miners. And our, our group, we're a global group. Our group was one of those groups that submitted a plan. And uh, we were selected to carry out Plan A. And, and I believe we were selected because we were in the best position to mobilize quickly. It was very important for the Chilean government to get started right away. And so the breakthrough of that hole occurred on August 22nd. This is August 23rd. And we're mobilizing our drilling equipment from the Andina mine nearby to the San Jose mine. So very important to, to move quickly. Uh, you can picture the families of the miners and the miners. They don't want to be sitting around waiting for a week or two for people to decide, well, which plan are we going to select? So the Chilean government did a very smart thing here is they went with a plan they could mobilize right away. It wasn't an easy setup. We had to create roads. Uh, our system was to drill a vertical hole. So we only had one spot that we could locate the drill because we're drilling down to break through to the refuge station hole has to be vertical. That spot happened to be the most inaccessible spot uh, uh, on surface. And you can see the, uh, uh, we're, we're creating a road, dragging the equipment up the road. The, the police in the background are keeping the press off of the work site. That's what that horse is, uh, uh, that was an issue early on, uh, is uh, keeping the work site secure and safe uh, from, uh, from the public. 
the location of our, of our drilling program, uh, you can see it at the top there. Uh, uh, this is uh, a truck pouring concrete that's pouring the foundation for the drill. Uh, the, just off of the picture here is where the first hole broke through and where they're lowering materials down right here. So we were up fairly high. We were about 700 meters above the refuge station. And we were set up, this is the crew drilling by September 1st. So we mobilized August 23rd. This is a very quick mobilization for a project like this in terms of uh, the foundations, getting electrical power, getting water up there. Our program was to drill a 15 inch diameter hole, 700 meters deep. That was directionally drilled, it would be vertical and then to ream that hole to 28 inches diameter. The 28 inches was selected. That diameter had been used successfully before in rescuing people in un other underground operations. And I don't know if you saw the, uh, the mock-up of the capsule in the front, but that's a life-size mock-up of the capsule that rescued the miners. It's in the lobby. And that gives you an idea of the, of the uh, size of the rescue capsule. So here we are drilling, we're at the top of the hill, you can see the Atacama Desert in the background. It was definitely a 24 hour a day operation. The urgency, of course, uh, you know, lies in the balance. It was a very urgent project. Uh, the Chilean government did some very smart things. One thing they did was they said, we're not gonna put all our eggs in one basket. We're gonna look at a couple other technologies. They eventually selected three plans. Uh, plan C, which you see here, this is precision drilling in Calgary. There, there was a big Canadian uh, contingent involved in this rescue. And I think as Canadians, we're very humble. We don't brag about that a lot. But we, uh, we were very involved. Precision drilling at an oil drill rig, drilling a 28-inch diameter hole in one pass. Uh, a very big setup. Again, this picture taken from our, uh, our work site. Plan B was the plan that eventually broke through and the rescue was conducted through this hole. Plan B was, was a calculated risk that the government took. Uh, this is what we would call a well drill. One of the five inch holes that broke through, they decided to use it to try and open it up. This drill was designed to open up a five inch hole to 12 and a half and then to 28 inch. And it was really at the extreme capacity of this drill, but they persevered, they got the hole through and this is October 9th, they broke the hole through. From an engineering perspective, this was the biggest challenge of the project, to get that hole through. October 9th, the hole was broke through. Uh, from October 9th to October 12th, they set up the hoisting system, the Phoenix, and then by October 13th, the miners were on surface. So, uh, at that time, our operation, we were down 600 meters, we were put on hold, to make sure plan B was successful. If for any reason they weren't, we would have kept drilling. We were about 30 days away from completing our operations. So the government, by choosing some different uh, methods, uh, saved about 30 days, took about 30 days off the schedule. Uh, so I've mentioned a few things that the Chilean government did right. One other thing I want to point out, they opened their doors to collaboration globally. Okay? This was a global response to a local disaster. And, and I, I've never seen anything like it. They were totally accepting of people all over the world providing ideas uh, and uh, people came from everywhere. The mining industry pulled together. And the mining industry takes a lot of hits, but the mining industry was very impressive here. Nobody was looking to make money. Nobody was looking for any gain other than to get those guys up from underground. So a couple of observations. When we talk about safety, we talk about proactive and reactive. The rescue was reactive. Okay? The rescue was after the fact. There was a disaster that occurred that should never have occurred. And what we have to do in the mining industry and industry in general is to be proactive. Okay? Uh, Stephen Covey in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, the very first habit he refers to is being proactive. And if being proactive as an individual can lead to success, what about being proactive as a company? or a country. Okay. The presentations we've heard this morning are about situations we're in. Maybe some proactive thinking can get us out of those situations, but maybe we're in those already. If we are in a reactive situation, there's some lessons to be learned here too. Global collaboration 
to a local disaster save those miners? I wonder, when I wonder about what's possible, I wonder if global collaboration to global disasters will help save us. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>